evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to Delray Beach Public Library. My name is Isabella Rowan and I am the program coordinator here at the library. Please remain muted until the end of the program when we will take questions and comments. You are welcome to type your questions or remarks in the chat box or simply raise your hand um, at the end of our program when we have questions and discussion. Um, this, this program is being recorded. So just to let you know that, thank you. Um, Delray Beach Public Library is excited to be one of 20 organizations in the state of Florida to receive the Florida Spring Talks 2022 programming grant from Florida Humanities. Florida Talks, one of Florida Humanities longest running programs offers nonprofit organizations across Florida a way to host thought provoking and engaging presentations by experts and scholars from their distinguished speakers bureau. Tonight's program is a partnership between the Florida Humanities and Delray Beach Public Library. Funding for this program was provided by Florida Humanities <clears throat> and sponsored in part by the State of Florida, Department of State, Division of Arts and Culture, and the Florida Council, Council on Arts and Culture. We are a small but mighty library with a small budget with which to offer mighty programs. Grants such as this are extremely valuable and we are so grateful to be a recipient. Tonight's presentation is the magnificent drama, Martin Luther King in St. Augustine. Our presenter is Dr. J. Michael Butler. He is the Keenan Distinguished Professor of History at Flagler College where he has taught since August, 2008. He received both his master's and doctorate in history from the University of Mississippi where he specialized in 20th century Southern history with an emphasis on the civil rights movement. Dr. Butler co-authored Victory After the Fall, The Memories of Civil Rights Activist H.K. Matthews and has published numerous essays in various academic journals. His latest manuscript is titled Beyond Integration, The Black Freedom Struggle in Escambia County, Florida from 1960 to 2000. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Butler. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Owen. Um, I, there are benefits and drawbacks of having a program like this on Zoom. And I think one of the drawbacks for me is not being able to interact with uh, your wonderful patrons and the people who have actually given their time to come to this presentation. But on the bright side, it does get to reach people where they are. So I'm totally co cognizant of the fact that, um, you know, while this might be non-traditional, it is where we are in 2022. Um, I just hope I don't have students trying to come to my office during these late hours and they hear me in here lecturing to myself, although they'll probably understand if they are in my class. So, you know, it, it happens. Um, but yeah, thank you for an, the invite and uh, for the Florida Humanities Council for sponsoring such great programs. You know, tonight what I plan to do is discuss what Dr. King called the magnificent drama, which was actually what he called the civil rights movement in St. Augustine. I want it to be more conversational, and um, but I also want to go through some of the more important highlights of how the local is influenced by the state and how a local movement has national consequences, right? Um, so, you know, with no further ado, let me go ahead and jump in uh, to talking about the magnificent drama, Martin Luther King Jr. in St. Augustine. Now, look, there are a lot of things that I want to stress from the outset. Number one, the civil rights movement doesn't begin in 1963, nor does it end in 1968. St. Augustine is a microcosm of the movement in that for as long as there have been African Americans enslaved, as long as there has been emancipation, as long as there has been Jim Crow, there has been resistance to dehumanization. So when we say that the civil rights movement began at a certain period, we have to be really careful about how we frame that. What this lecture is going to revolve around 
is a really small window in time because of its significance. And it's going to be the 1963 and 1964 civil rights movement in St. Augustine and America as a whole. So, you know, thank you for indulging me on explaining that the civil rights movement doesn't start and end at any one particular time, but it is a pattern of resistance to second class citizenship that began long before the 20th century began and still has ramifications and is ongoing today. Another question that I often get when I talk about this particular topic is, is St. Augustine a southern town? Is Florida a place that actually had an important civil rights movement? You know, when we think of the quote unquote greatest hits of the civil rights movement, we often think of Selma, and Birmingham and Montgomery, Atlanta and Albany and Mississippi. We usually don't think about Florida, but I can assure you, Florida had and has a vibrant, complex, deep civil rights history, and St. Augustine is no exception. I would posit that St. Augustine had much more in common with the rest of the Deep South than it did much of the rest of Florida. And the reason that I say that is because the concept of paternalism was very, very powerful in this town, particularly as a tourist-based economy. Now, what paternalism basically means is that if people of a certain race and class stay in their so-called place, they would be taken care of. White people would take care of African-Americans as long as they knew their role in society, as long as they were subservient, as long as they worked in the service industries in the tourist economy, and more importantly, as long as they maintained and respected the racial status quo. Now, St. Augustine, like many other Southern towns during this period, had a residential segregation. There was actually Lincolnville where African-Americans lived, which is separate from downtown St. Augustine per se. Um, it was called colloquially inward town by white people. And as long as that rigid segregation in both residence and behavior was observed, then the idea was that the kind white people of St. Augustine would take care of African-Americans in the area. This is where we get in St. Augustine, as I'm going to reference later, the idea that we had good race relations in St. Augustine, that everything was fine because what they're saying is people knew their place and they did not try to challenge it. That's why people like Robert Haling, not just in St. Augustine, but throughout the South are so very important. Now, Dr. Robert B. Haling was an Air Force veteran, Florida native. His father was actually a professor at Florida A&M University in Tallahassee. Um, he was a dentist. He was, and this is important, an outsider at least in the local parlance, right? Anybody who doesn't have family connections and grew up in St. Augustine is an outsider. Dr. Haling had an integrated dental practice. Every time that I've had a chance to talk to Dr. Haling, he always mentioned that his, who's gonna become his biggest nemesis, Sheriff L.O. Davis was also a patient. And he also mentioned that he had terrible teeth. So Dr. Haling is in this position where most of his clients are white. His dentist office is actually on the edge of Lincolnville. You know, it's sort of in between the two worlds, but he was really inspired and encouraged by St. Augustine young people, people like Hank Thomas, who was one of the original freedom writers from St. Augustine. Young people who in the rest of the country were doing things like sitting in and starting a revolution. They were participating in campaigns like Birmingham, more on that as we go. He saw number one, a youthful enthusiasm in St. Augustine from people who wanted to make and bring change. 
He also understood the hesitancy of more established middle class, older black residents who had a lot to lose by speaking out. Where Dr. Haling thought he could make the biggest difference was as the youth council supervisor of an organization that already existed in San Augustine, and that was the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Now, they did not have a youth council branch until Dr. Haling volunteered to be its advisor. This is a picture of Dr. Haling um, from 2010 in the bottom left of the screen. And here's a picture of Dr. Haling in 1963 in St. Augustine. So Dr. Haling was really interested in mobilizing and organizing nonviolent demonstrations here. He was really inspired by events that were occurring throughout the South and young people in this town asked him, what can we do to bring change? Well, one of the things that's going on here that's kind of in the background that I think you need to understand is that St. Augustine, um, I love the city, but it has kind of an inferiority complex. And what I mean by that is St. Augustine, as is advertised, is the nation's oldest city. St. Augustine has always felt that it did not get its fair shake in American history books, right? I'll give you a great example of that. Um, I heard a, a prominent local historian say, that when Black people arrived in Jamestown in 1619, St. Augustine was undergoing urban renewal. So the idea of Black history actually starts in St. Augustine, American history actually starts in St. Augustine, is something that the city has always wanted to elevate. The quadricentennial was that opportunity, okay? The quadricentennial was St. Augustine's 400th anniversary. This was the event that was gonna be St. Augustine's opportunity to put itself squarely within American history. There was a lot of boosterism. There was a lot of civic pride. There was a lot of engagement that went on with the quadricentennial, but most importantly, there was a lot of federal money to be donated. There was a lot of federal money to grab. A celebration would occur in which the vice president of the United States, Lyndon Johnson, because he was vice president at the time in 1963, came to St. Augustine and announced the beginning of the St. Augustine Quadricentennial. Millions of dollars were at stake, literally. The NAACP and the NAACP Youth Council wanted to protest the event. They had asked to be involved in the planning they had been ignored. There were no African-Americans on the planning committees. There were no plans to include Black St. Augustinians in the celebration. So the NAACP, including Robert Haley, had planned to protest in front of this college, in front of what used to be uh, the Ponce Hotel, in the front where this ceremony was taking place. So city leaders finally responded to NAACP concerns and said, you know, hey, don't protest. We will, number one, guarantee you a place at the banquet where the vice president will speak. We will give you a meeting with city commissioners and include you in the dialogue that will take place about the planning of the celebration. So in other words, don't rain on our parade. The NAACP decided with Dr. Haling and its president, a lady named Fanny Fullwood, they decided that they would give the city a chance. And they were given a table in the dining hall where Vice President Johnson kicked off the celebration, and it was a separate enclave 
at the very top of the dining hall, separated from the rest of the diners and guarded by secret service agents. They were not allowed to interact with anyone. According to Dr. Haling, they did not even have a clear view of the vice president. It was like nobody knew they were there. The next day when they were supposed to meet with city commissioners, the group went to city hall and they saw a secretary waiting for them with a tape recorder in the middle of the table. They were each asked to state their grievances. The record button was hit and sure enough, all four people gave their perspectives. And as Dr. Haling said, we all felt like we'd been hoodwinked. This was sort of the breaking point in terms of Dr. Haling mobilizing local protests. Nonviolent demonstrations began soon thereafter with Labor Day of 1963 being the coming out party. Now the photograph on the bottom right is actually from this period, from the Labor Day weekend. That is the main plaza in St. Augustine. And that is the so-called slave market where, yeah, you can see that people, that the young people are carrying signs that basically stated, we're Americans, we're citizens. I'm an American also, my father died defending this country wear old clothes with new dignity. This is the chief of police, Virgil Stewart, who is there to read and intimidate just by his very presence. But look, the bottom line is, as Robert Haling often said, I earned my citizenship in the Air Force. I don't have to beg nobody for nothing, is how he put it. Nonviolent protest in which there were demands. What Dr. Haling and the NAACP asked for, integrated public facilities, some African-American employment, downtown establishments, and most importantly, the formation of a biracial committee. Now, this is going to be really important because a biracial committee was an official city committee that was made up of white and black leaders so that when there was discrimination or there were tensions or there was unease related to race, citizens could bring that to the biracial committee and they could recommend a solution, right? In other words, a democratic safety valve of sorts and the city refused. They also wanted there to be some activities for African-Americans as part of the quadricentennial, it didn't happen, right? The city refused. The mayor of the town was, was a prominent physician. His name was Joseph Shelley. And his reasoning was, <laughs> follow me on this. The formation of a biracial committee acknowledges that there are racial differences and we don't think that people are different. Tell my students all the time if you try to make sense of racism it's going to drive you nuts because there is no reason and there is no rationale to it right we're not going to have this committee to mediate racial differences because we are not different and that assumes that we are okay the thing about saint augustine too is that all of this activity is percolating under the surface well not even under the surface it's happening on the surface with black activism. Um, it draws the attention of white agitators outside of St. Augustine and within. In other words, 1963 is a really important year for reasons that I'll talk about in a minute in the American Civil Rights Movement. Not only are African Americans now invigorated and determined to not let discrimination persist and to fight it nonviolently. But white vigilante groups are more determined than ever to use violence, terror, and intimidation to maintain the racial status quo. One of the things that um, 
we've learned in studying the historical community and, and people in St. Augustine have learned was that um, as early as 1962, there are a, a variety of reasons for it, a, a variety of speculative uh, explanations for it. But there were FBI agents in St. Augustine monitoring Black activism. Well before Dr. Haling even started and organized these protests. So one of the things about this uh, demonstrate, one of the things about this movement in St. Augustine is that we know so much about it because the FBI was getting daily reports in its Jacksonville office about what was happening in St. Augustine. And one of the things that was happening in St. Augustine, in addition to intensified nonviolent demonstrations and protests, was the growth of extremely violent opposition. Now, that violent opposition came from a few different places. First, locally. Now, one of the things about St. Augustine as well that makes it a little different than the rest of the South is that the predominant form of Christianity that really dominates St. Augustine is not the Baptist, Methodist, or Episcopalian church. Catholicism. And one of the things with a group like the Ku Klux Klan is that they did not allow Catholics to join. So a local group that formed consisted primarily of uh, the Menorcan population, Catholic, not allowed to join the Klan, already had a gun club that met called the Ancient City Gun Club. They were led by a man named Hoss Manusi, and they were absolutely a white supremacist organization. Make no mistake about it. So you had, and they can justifiably say, we don't belong to the Ku Klux Klan, because they didn't. They were different. But they were Catholic blood brothers of the Ku Klux Klan. The Ku Klux Klan does get involved. And, you know, one of the the largest groups of the Ku Klux Klan in America at this time was in Duval, North East Florida. Okay. Their resistance was violent. It attracted, it's not just the KKK and the Ancient City Gun Club. They worked together, but they also worked with local law enforcement. And that's where the rub comes. That's where some of the problems come for local Blacks, because they said that there was, well, as Dr. Haling said, the only difference between the Sheriff's Department in St. John's County and the Ku Klux Klan was the uniform that they wore at the time. And there's some truth to that. There's, there's a lot of truth to that. We know that later, each morning, Hoss Manusi, the mayor of St. Augustine, the sheriff and the police chief would meet to coordinate their day's monitoring of the nonviolent protests. We have outsiders like Connie Lynch, the racist reverend from California. It is a white nationalist church. This was actually taken in St. Augustine in front of the slave market. Um, he's brought, he comes in because he wanted to quote unquote, save the good white people of St. Augustine from this black menace that was Robert Halen. We had J.B. Stoner, who was the president of the National States Rights Party out of Georgia. So it's really interesting that when you hear the epithet that's actually used outside agitators, it's usually used against civil rights act advocates, but it was actually the outside agitators were the, the white supremacists that looked at St. Augustine as their last stand. This is where white people would stand up against the communist inspired agitation they claimed that was their civil rights movement a local story. And this involves Dr. Haling and three other gentlemen, including a who was 16 years old at the time, a man named James Jackson. 
The Klan was brazen about the fact that they were having cross burnings and that they were having meetings on land not far from where I'm sitting right now, just a few miles down the road off of US-1. Well, Dr. Haling told me that his car was often targeted for these flyers that advertised the meetings because he drove a bright red convertible VW bug. He received one of these flyers that announced a Klan rally, all white people invited to an event on September 18th, 1963. So Dr. Haling, who had no ounce of back down in him, which was one of the things that rubbed local people the wrong way. He called it like it was, and he was, he did not live in fear. He decided he wanted to see what the Klan had to say. So, Haley, three other gentlemen, including teenage James Jackson, decided that they would go because there was a road that kind of cut behind the meeting place. Long story short, they turn down this road and they see two armed Klansmen walking toward them. Dr. Haling was driving. He tried to back out. It had been raining and his car got stuck in the mud. The men pointed the guns at them, ordered them to get out. And Dr. Haling told me he had a 357 Magnum in the glove compartment and he contemplated reaching for it, but he didn't want to put the people in the car at risk, which again, that's going to blur the line. Yes, nonviolence is a tactic, but I don't want you to think for a second that self-defense was not part of the civil rights movement because it was. He didn't reach for the gun though, right? They were literally walked down a path to the stage where Connie Lynch was speaking. There were in between three and 500 people who were there. And the thing that both Mr. Jackson and Dr. Haling said was that the most hateful, the meanest, the most quote unquote, as Dr. Haling said, the most evil people there were the women. They were demanding a lynching. They were demanding castration. And according to Dr. Haling, as they were walked to the stage, Connie Lynch, proclaimed, well, 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 look who we have here. We now know that there was a white minister from Daytona Beach who was asked to go document, infiltrate the meeting. And when he saw Dr. Haling and three other NAACP members being walked out, he immediately backed up and left. We know that Mr. Cheney, Irv Cheney, called the St. John's County Sheriff's Department and told them exactly what was about to happen and said he was calling the State Department in Tallahassee and the FBI headquarters in Jacksonville to stop it. Back at the meeting, Dr. Haling remembered being beaten, unconscious. He had his fingers broken. He later said that he thought they went for his fingers because he was a dentist and they wanted to prevent him from working. The last thing he remembered as the four men who were beaten, and Mr. Jackson confirms this too, they were all piled up like Mr. Jackson said, like cordwood. And the last thing Dr. Haling remembered before he lost consciousness was Connie Lynch saying, how many of you have ever had the pleasure of smelling an N-word burn? And he lost consciousness. It was at that time that Sheriff L.O. Davis stepped in and arrested the four men for disturbing the peace. It stopped a lynching. And that's why the bullet point describes a near lynching. Now, they were arrested. 
Um, what we what we know now, the suspicion is Mr. Cheney believes this, and Dr. Haling, who's no longer with us, and Mr. Jackson, who is, they both are certain that L.O. Davis was at that meeting, that the sheriff was there, and that he got the CB announcement that someone has called and said the state and the federal government's about to get involved. And the last thing local law enforcement during the civil rights movement, particularly in Florida, wanted was for the state and especially the federal government to start poking their head into things. So he stopped it. It saved them from death. This is the level of violence that existed in this part of Florida in 1963. And it led to the NAACP firing Robert Haling as their youth director. The reason is because the NAACP, and I'm not going to go into this in too great of detail, but we tend to look at the movement as all organizations were on the same page and they all had the same objectives and tactics, and that's not true. The NAACP was a very top-down, very legalistic, anti-public demonstration. The NAACP placed an emphasis on challenging the racial status quo through the justice system, the Legal Defense Fund, Thurgood Marshall, Brown versus Board. That was their angle. They thought that allowing someone like Dr. Haling to organize and eventually risk the lives of other people would complicate their legal efforts, right? So it's a different strategy. They did not approve of Dr. Haling's organization and tactics. They had told him tread lightly several times, and when he almost gets lynched, they cut ties. Dr. Haling decides to reach out to a different organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, SCLC. Southern Christian Leadership Conference was founded in 1957 by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It emphasized grassroots organization. It emphasized non-violent protest. It mentioned redemptive love. It emphasized that, I should say. SCLC was Dr. King. Dr. King was SCLC, okay? Haling reaches out to SCLC, who just happened to have their annual conference in Orlando in 1963. And they decided that they would take up the St. Augustine struggle and help the residents here in the midst of all this violence. Now, one of the things that I love about what I do, I love about what I study is that it demonstrates who we are as America, right? Because this is all of our history. This is American history. And American history is not supposed to make us feel comfortable. It's supposed to make us reflect upon how the past informs the present. Why does this matter? It matters because it's a story of how we have over time tried to achieve a more perfect union. This has national relevance. This is not just something that's happening in Northeast Florida. This is actually, and you can tell, uh, this is a primary source that SCLC actually created. St. Augustine, it was a pamphlet, 400 years of bigotry and hate. You can see that they're latching on to that quadricentennial, supported and maintained by Northern tourist dollars. What SCLC basically wanted to do was to advertise the plight of Dr. Haling and urge people to stay away from St. Augustine. A boycott of the quadricentennial. Perspective, context. This is really important in the study of history because history doesn't occur in a vacuum. One of the reasons that St. Augustine and the white resistance that existed here was so vicious was because of what is happening throughout the rest of the South and nation at this time. One of the things that inspired Dr. Haling tremendously 
was the Birmingham campaign of 1963. We know the story. Here is the photo that President Kennedy said made him physically ill when he saw it. Police dogs, water hoses, eventually, just days before Dr. Haling is almost lynched, the bombing of 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham and four little girls die. Birmingham was a turning point in the movement because on the national level, it changed SCLC's approach. You see, before Birmingham, SCLC had been fighting segregation on a case-by-case -case basis. Montgomery, the bus boycott. Albany, Georgia. Eh, Atlanta. Nashville. With Birmingham, Dr. King, Fred Shuttlesworth, SCLC, Andrew Young, all of these Black ministers decided that, you know, we can push for national attention to spark outrage, which demands political intervention. And that political intervention was one piece of legislation that would end segregation with a signature. That was the Civil Rights Act, right? So Birmingham, for a variety of reasons, and I'm not going to go into it in, in much detail, but Birmingham's a turning point for the movement because it changes SELC's outlook and strategy. Instead of fighting city by city, images like this would draw national attention, create outrage, and result in political change. That was the goal. They wanted President Kennedy to announce his support of a civil rights bill. And he does. In June 1963, President Kennedy goes on national television and calls civil rights the great moral crisis of our time. And he pledges to personally present a civil rights act to Congress when it was in session. This leads to the March on Washington right? The I have a dream speech. The March on Washington as well didn't happen in a vacuum. The March on Washington was and remains the largest civil rights demonstration in American history. The, the six largest civil rights groups in America did something that they haven't done before and haven't done since. They worked together on one massive campaign because they wanted to demonstrate to President Kennedy who feared losing Southern Democrats, that the political support across the nation for this bill was on his side and to hold him accountable. It's one thing for a politician to make a promise, but I know, don't tell anybody, maybe we shouldn't record this, but politicians don't always keep their word. So the March on Washington was meant to let President Kennedy know you're gonna be held accountable for the promises that you've made. March on Washington was a day long celebration, part pep rally, part church service, part concert. Heck, before Dr. King gave the keynote, Bob Dylan performed. Dr. King, because of Birmingham, was the final speaker and that's where he gave the I Have a Dream speech. This is why white people in this area, those who become committed to violence, are so inspired to utilize it because their world was coming to a, their world was changing. This was where St. Augustine, we would make a stand for white supremacy, according to groups like the Klan and the National States Rights Party. Now, when JFK is assassinated, November 1963, now, what are the states? Now we have a Texan, Lyndon B. Johnson, who is president of the United States. And the question is, what is his angle going to be when it comes to the Civil Rights Act? This is why St. Augustine is important. 
it is both reflecting and influencing trends that are happen, happening that have national importance. Dr. King decides that St. Augustine would be a place that should be investigated for the racial trouble that happened. And Dr. King sends one of his lieutenants uh, named Hosea Williams, and that's H-O-S-E-A. Hosea Williams is a tremendous guy. Um, but he was one of Dr. King's lieutenants, and he was sent along with Dorothy Cotton to St. Augustine to interview people, to see what the struggle was about, to determine if SELC needed to get involved here. And Hosea Williams was absolutely bowled over by the support, by the enthusiasm of the Black community here. SELC decided that they would sponsor an Easter campaign, an Easter campaign in which SCLC members from across the nation would come to St. Augustine and boycott, protest, as the Civil Rights Act was working its way through Congress. One of the people who came to St. Augustine as a member of SCLC and is arrested for dining in a segregated cafe was this lady, Mary Peabody the mother of the governor of Massachusetts. Robert Haling was with her, as were, was one of her best friends, Esther Burgess. That's L.O. Davis arresting her. International attention, right? In St. Augustine, Florida, the mother of the governor of Massachusetts has been arrested for trying to dine in a restaurant with her best friend and Dr. Haley. Dr. King came to St. Augustine. He gave a sermon in which he declared that St. Augustine was where the magnificent drama of America's destiny was unfolding. He was not allowed to lead a march while he was in St. Augustine because most of the marching, one of Jose Williams' uh, tactics was night marches so that we could get older African-Americans who had to work, not just students, but older African-Americans participated. St. Augustine remains, I mean, it was built on the Spanish model, right? The streets are narrow. The streets even now, poorly lit. There was so much violence that occurred on these marches that the fear was if Dr. King's going to be assassinated in any city, if he's going to be shot, it's going to be St. Augustine. The plaza was ground zero. For whatever reason, I, you know, I think I understand why, but the, our main plaza in front of the slave market was where the Klan would gather nightly and give their speeches and spew their venom. The churches were where the mass meetings were happening, where SELC organized the mass meetings. They would sing, they would hear a religious message, they would be given instructions on how to conduct themselves, and they would march two by two to the plaza to demonstrate that they weren't afraid. Dr. King saw all this, he doesn't participate because of the danger, and after he left the first time, he sent another person to St. Augustine, Andrew Young, to stop the St. Augustine movement. The reason that Dr. King comes into St. Augustine, gives a sermon, monitors the situation, and leaves the first time he's here. He sends Reverend Andrew Young to St. Augustine and tells him, put an end to the campaign. It's too dangerous. People are going to get hurt. The marches are nightly. The violence is only intensifying. People are being hospitalized. They're being attacked by Klan members in the ancient city gun club. 
And this is going to sabotage the Civil Rights Act as it's making its way through Congress. Southern Democrats are going to point to a place like St. Augustine and see, say, see, that's what's going to happen if we pass this bill. St. Augustine is going to be replicated in every city throughout the South. So, um, and again, I know that I sort of go off a little bit on the side stories, but the side stories are important. Dr. King had two major lieutenants, Hosea Williams, who was the organizer. He was the grassroots person. He was the damn the consequences. Let's do what's right by these people. Andrew Young was the more conservative negotiator. He was the politician. Surprise. Meant later becoming mayor of Atlanta and the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. It makes sense. So he was going to send Reverend Young to St. Augustine to put an end to the struggle. Andrew Young arrived in St. Augustine in the middle of a mass meeting. And when he walked in, Hosea Williams basically said, here's Reverend Nandy Young to lead us in our march tonight. And it, <laughs> according to Andrew Young, uh, he felt like every head in the church turned around and looked at him and he didn't even bring a toothbrush, St. Augustine, right? And he knew then, he said, I knew then I'd been got. What are you going to say? No. So he did. In the next few days, Reverend Young became convinced that this is what we're fighting against in terms of the legislation. We can't abandon these people in St. Augustine because the outcome won't be good. Instead of using St. Augustine as a reason to not threaten the Civil Rights Act. Reverend Young, Hosea Williams convinced Dr. King that the movement had to continue, that we needed to make St. Augustine an example of why the Civil Rights Act needed to be passed. Here is where Dr. King stayed on St. Augustine Beach. Um, this is a, a, a press conference when Dr. King came back. Now, Dr. King, he came to St. Augustine on three different occasions. He would come in and leave. He was here to 10 days total, right? But when King came, the cameras came with him. And he always referenced what was going on in Congress with the Civil Rights Act. Um, this is an interesting story. Um, the one thing that Dr. King feared were German shepherds. L.O. Davis knew that. And when Dr. King was arrested, I'm going to tell you about that in a minute, L.O. Davis opened up the, the door and put the German shepherd in the back with him. It just gives you an idea of the venom that existed here, right? Eventually, the protests are going to move to the beach. Swim ins. St. Augustine became a place where SELC wanted to keep the nation's media focused here. Again, to keep public pressure on Congress to pass the Civil Rights Act. And violence is trans ported from the square to the beaches. And it reiterated that even the beaches in the South were segregated. State troopers are sent to St. Augustine. Dr. King is arrested on the 11th of June for trying to enter a segregated dining area. Now, it just happened to be the Monson Motor Lodge, okay? Um, I did miss something that's really important. I think one of the reasons that Andrew Young had such a change of heart was because on one of the first marches he wanted to lead in St. Augustine, the only time in his life he is beaten unconscious, he's attacked, beaten unconscious, finished the march. And that was his turning point. It's like, no, 
we can't turn back now. Um, more on that later. But June 11th, 1964 is when Dr. King is arrested. This was part of keeping the public attention throughout the world focused on St. Augustine. Jimmy Brock was the owner of the Monson Motor Lodge. The Mon he was the uh, president of the Florida Hotel Owners Association. The Monson Motor Lodge was one of the largest hotels on our Bayfront. It's significant. It's where the Ancient City Gun Club, police, civic leaders met every morning to kind of go over their day. Dr. King tries to enter. Mr. Brock says, you can't, segregated by law. If you don't leave, I'm gonna to have to arrest you and he's arrested, right? Here is Dr. King in the uh, St. John's County Jail, uh, the only place in Florida where Dr. King was ever arrested. And it was for a strategic purpose to keep attention focused on the problem of segregation in this country so that Congress in the middle of the longest filibuster in Senate history would finally break it and vote to approve the Civil Rights Act. A week later, the Monson Motor Lodge is going to become another place or the place of another episode in this magnificent drama. June 18, 1964. One of the things that um, happened to give context to this picture is that a white SCLC member named Reverend Al Lingo had actually checked into the Monson Motor Lodge as a guest because he had a plan. He was going to invite his friends and he asked and was allowed. The Motor Lodge said you could invite guests into the pool. Well, he didn't tell them that he was an SCLC member and he didn't tell them that the guests he were he intended to invite were a group of African-American teenagers. One of the things about history that I love so much is you can't write this stuff. You can't. Truth is so much more interesting than fiction because at the same time that black swimmers were going to enter the pool with Reverend Lingo. And here's a picture of Reverend Lingo, by the way. Uh, Ali, about to be hit on the head with the billy club. Um, a group of Jewish rabbis who were in St. Augustine, approximately 30, go to the front of the motor lodge, ask to dine in an interracial group. Of course, they're denied, and they all bowed in prayer, and Jimmy Brock just lost it. He began pushing the uh, rabbis. He called the police, and that remains to this day the largest single mass arrest of Jewish rabbis in American history. <laughs> At the same time, Jimmy Brock, here's a splash. Four African-Americans had jumped into the pool. He goes over, picks up a bottle of muriatic acid and begins pouring it in the pool. Now, SELC knew that they were gonna try to integrate the pool, so they had photographers waiting. This image, becomes one of the most iconic photographs of the civil rights movement of an interracial group in a swimming pool with the owner of the motel pouring muriatic acid into the pool. Now, um, I've had the opportunity to talk to uh, one of the individuals who was there, JT Johnson. He was actually a lifeguard and he was telling them, hey, this is not gonna harm us. This is harmless. But the point was, this is what segregation in the South looked like. And the very next morning, a vote was going to be held to stop the Senate filibuster. And that photograph was on the front page of Washington newspapers. George McGovern told Andrew Young that senators were talking about this photograph on the morning of the vote to end the filibuster. They do. The filibuster ended. 
the Civil Rights Act was passed. And it was signed into law on July 2nd, 1964. Dr. King was in St. Augustine when he received word that the act had passed. He went to Washington for the signing. The Civil Rights Act prohibited discrimination based on race, age, gender, the list goes on and on and on. The Civil Rights Act is the most important piece of legislation, in my opinion, passed in the 20th century. The reason is simple. It impacts all of us even to this very day because it says that no state can discriminate against a citizen even in terms of employment. It established the Fair Employment Practices Commission. It ended Jim Crow with the stroke of a pen. But what does that mean for St. Augustine? The movement ended. Segregation's dead. Here's the photograph, by the way, of Dr. King in St. Augustine when he received word that it had passed. He's given the victory, finally. He wins the 1964 Nobel Peace Prize for his work in having the 64 Civil Rights Act passed. But SCLC had no exit plan in St. Augustine. The law changed. They asked for the, a biracial committee, the formation of a biracial committee. The mayor promised it and SELC left. One of the career highlights that I've had is having the chance to publicly interview, have a discussion with Andrew Young. And one of the questions that I asked was why toward the end of his life, when Dr. King had a habit, you know, he, he's a preacher, so he has his sermons, right? He has his go-to lines. He would talk about what he has seen in Montgomery and Birmingham, and he talked about Mississippi and how change had come there, but yet there's more change. He would mention all these places where he went, Albany and Atlanta and Birmingham, Selma, but he never mentioned St. Augustine. And I asked Reverend Young, why was St. Augustine not a part of SCLC's legacy? And he kind of laughed, he laughed and said words that I'll never forget. He said, because we wanted to forget about it. And the reason that he said they wanted to forget about it was because they knew they abandoned the city with no negotiated settlement. According to Dr. King, one of the only things he said about St. Augustine was that some communities had to bear the cross for all others. St. Augustine was one of those places. The biracial committee that was formed has yet to meet because as soon as SCLC left, every white member resigned. What happens at the local level during the movement both reflected and inspired greater national change? Local leaders, local people, are the ones who make the civil rights movement what it is. I used the Martin Luther King in St. Augustine to get y'all here, right? But the thing that you'll notice is that the real leader, the facilitator, the catalyst of the movement, I'm, I stopped talking about, and that's Dr. Haley. He loses his business, he loses his home, his dog is killed, his home is shot into, his wife, only through the grace of God, is not killed, his family had to leave the town. Eventually, Dr. Haling lost everything and went to Cocoa, Florida. Some communities had to bear the cross for others. The movement 
is much bigger than one man. It occurred because local people risked everything for a better United States for all other citizens. So I think that's where I'll stop. Um, I'll stop the share and take questions, but you know, that's, I hope I gave you some things to think about, some, um, uh, some potential questions. I, I knew that I was going to go over. I, I told Isabella that we would try to uh, keep it to 45 minutes, uh, but I, I'm more than happy to entertain questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Butler. This is fascinating. As someone who's a northern transplant to Florida, there's a lot about Florida state history that I don't know. So I personally learned a lot tonight. So thank you so much. Um, is there anyone who has any questions or comments? Um, feel free to, to put it in the chat box. There's a couple of comments and there's some thank yous for a great presentation and such. Someone did make a comment about, um, let me see about the dog, that they um, thought the dog in the car was part of the escort, not meant to be a, you know, a threat or no, whatever. No, that was done intentionally uh, to harass. Um, what I will, I see one of the questions about the lawyer from Daytona, that was Dan Warren, all right? Dan Warren was the state attorney and he lived in Daytona and he actually wrote a memoir, uh, If It Takes All Summer. So yeah, he was the, it's really fascinating because this story, this history, when you really dive into it, different people had different angles on how this story worked out based on their positions. I personally think, okay, so Reverend, Ab uh, not Reverend Abernathy, Andrew Young always said that, you know, for him, the biggest moment in St. Augustine was him being beaten unconscious because it, like I said, it's the only time that he was beaten to that degree in the entire movement. Um, he was also seen as sort of the negotiator and he wasn't somebody who got his hands dirty like Hosea Williams. And for him, that was like a badge of honor. But I think that the most important thing he did was after the attention came because he was beaten to the degree that he was. The city of St. Augustine said, no more night marches, no more night marches. Andrew Young filed a suit against L.O. Davis in the city to prevent them from canceling marches. It goes to Brian Simpson in Jacksonville and he sided with SELC and said, no, you can't ban marches. It's a violation of their constitutional rights. And guess what? SCLC used that same decision to continue marches in places like Selma and Memphis. So, you know, there are so many levels and layers to the story that have national significance that I didn't even really touch on. But um, that that's just, I saw that about the, uh, um, ah, the story of Dr. King having to be snuck out of St. Augustine in a coffin and a hearse to escape the city. Yeah, that was how he got out of downtown. Uh, it was in, um, oh goodness, I'm, I'm, it's slipping my mind. Um, but yes, there is a, uh, an African-American mortuary and they actually would provide rides um, of, of these activists from the airport in Jacksonville into the city so that they would not be stopped. If the police would see, and the Ancient City Gun Club, trust me, they are patrolling St. Augustine, they have CB radios, and when they see something like carload of outsiders coming in, they would radio it into the sheriff. But if you've got the, uh, the undertaker in a hearse bringing people in, they wouldn't stop them because that was seen as quote unquote normal. I don't, I've never confirmed that he was actually, Dr. King was actually in a coffin. That is one of those local legends, but we do know that the hearse was used as a common transportation device to get people in and out of the city without being harassed. 
there's a question a little bit earlier than that one about why did the SCLC abandon St. Augustine? Oh, that's a great question. Um, the Civil Rights Act passed. That was their objective. The Civil Rights Act um, was signed into law. And here's the thing, anytime, whether it's Birmingham, Albany, in a city, in a campaign, SELC always wanted to have an exit strategy. These are the demands. This is what we want. And we're not leaving until we at least get some compromise on that, some recognition. Why are they in St. Augustine? They're in St. Augustine. Jose Williams loves the city, loves the people, loves the struggle. They're here to elevate the problem of segregation for the rest of the world. And trust me, this gets international attention. So what happens when they get the bill? I, there are so many stories for me. One of the interesting parts of uh, this entire campaign is what happens afterward. St. Augustine is a small city. Many of the Klansmen and the white agitators leave, but they have local allies. Whites and Blacks in St. Augustine had to live together after this. The Monson Motor Lodge, Jimmy Brock, the person whose worst moment was on the front page of newspapers throughout America and the world, he now had to follow the law and integrate. And the Klan firebombed his motor lodge. The fact about the St. Augustine movement that I always leave with students, and I can't believe I didn't leave this with the formal lecture, but my apologies. According to Andrew Young, St. Augustine was the only campaign that SCLC led in which medical expenses exceeded legal costs. Not Selma, not Birmingham, not Mississippi. St. Augustine had more violence, hospitalizations, and medical costs because of the frequency of the attacks. That, in a nutshell, is St. Augustine. The, the, the person who covered up Reverend Young was um, a man from Savannah named Willie Bolden. And Willie Bolden told me that, you know, we were, we were talking and he, he said, yeah, Selma was really bad. And I'm like, why? I, I did not know that you were in Selma. Uh, Edmund Pettus, Bloody Sunday. He's like, yeah, I was there. I was like, oh, that had to have been incredible. And he said, yeah, but that was one event. That happened in St. Augustine on an almost a nightly basis. So when you have someone who was at the Pettus Bridge on Bloody Sunday say, that wasn't as bad as what we encountered in St. Augustine, that gives you an idea of how violent and how dangerous this place was. So yeah, any other questions? But look, this is, I'll, I'll give my caveat about how this is history that we should be proud of. Because America responded. We have a long way to go in terms of realizing racial equality. But this is a nonviolent protest to ensure that civil rights are applied to all citizens equally, regardless of color, race, nationality, sexual orientation. It's still relevant today. This is our history, warts and all. And it's not comfortable. History is not meant to make us comfortable. It's meant to make us reflect on how the past continues to inform the present. Um, yeah. Some of our African-American friends in Lincolnville still fear white supremacy and its terror. Uh, we saw that last year. We saw it two years ago when the Confederate monument was moved and you had terrorist organizations like the Proud Boys that came to St. Augustine and it was all very reminiscent of what happened in 64. Uh, the, 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 look, 
In that regard, St. Augustine's not a lot different than the rest of the nation because we've had a growth of incivility and hatred and targeting people who aren't a part of the racial majority. That's one of my good friends is Gail Phillips. She is the director of the Lincolnville Cultural Center, right? And um, yeah, she has stories. Make no mistake about it. There aren't just episodes of racial threat and threats and threats of violence that still occur. But there's a backlash against the teaching of uncomfortable history. There are individuals who don't want to talk about this historical topic. And I think that not understanding the civil rights movement is kind of like trying to comprehend your favorite movie while taking out one of the main characters. It doesn't make sense anymore. African American history is our history. Period. Hard stop. It's American history. And it's a struggle for how citizens in a democratic republic can advocate and achieve a more perfect union. That's not theory. That's not something that we should be ashamed of, something that we should embrace. If we love the Constitution, we love all parts, right? The 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, and so on and so on, not just one amendment. If we love America, in my opinion, we should want its principles applied to all citizens equally. So, yeah, it still exists. Um, for, for people to say that, uh, you know, we're beyond racism, we're post-racial, you just, that you, you, you don't, history indicates that for every step we make forward in terms of civil rights and racial justice, there's going to be a backlash. There's going to be three to four steps backward for every step we make forward. And part of, I'm, I'm getting, okay, so I'm going to get my high horse and put it on top of my soapbox here for a minute, you know, and get up on it. Um, but part of studying this history is understanding that what we're going through now is nothing new under the sun. Education helps enlighten and helps keep us vigilant. And that's its importance. Um, oh, thank you. I'm getting a lot of compliments. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. See? See, Isabella, the, the Zoom thing worked out. Yes, um, it hey, make, seriously, it doesn't take long. It, even if you didn't like it, um, fill out the, the recommendations because now more than ever, there is a war on historical truth. And I really want the Florida Humanities Council and the Delray Beach Library to understand that there are more people who seek knowledge than seek to repress knowledge. And they need to hear those voices. Because the voices that want to ban, threaten, and harass are the loudest, but I think they're the minority. So, you know, that's my plug for, for filling out the evaluations. That's great. Thank you so much. You've given us much to think about. It was very informative, very thought-provoking, and I think it's um, a challenge to us to to consider what we need to do to make sure things are more equal and better in the future, because there is plenty of room for improvement and <laughs> plenty of room. So I encourage all of you here today to, you know, to pick up the to pick up the torch, as they say, and go forward with the information that we know now and, um, and do our best in the future together. So thank you so much, Dr. Butler. This was thank fantastic. You. I'm so glad you said yes. Thank I'm so you. glad we got this grant. <laughs> so I just appreciate your time and the time of everyone who's here today. 
please join us for you know other things coming up in the program. And um, I, if anyone ha has anything else to say, actually the library is gonna close in about eight minutes and I'll be sitting here in the dark. So if you have something to say, make it quick, but otherwise, <laughs> We, you know, we will say, we will say good night. Thank you once again for having me. It was a, a joy and uh, I look forward to uh, joining the good folks in Delray Beach one day uh, in person. That would be awesome. Thank you so it. much. Good luck with it. everything in the future. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.